Joyce, you want to pick it up like this? I was just trying to do it before the Are you ready, Marilyn? Uh, uh, yes, I'm ready. Okay, here we go. So, good evening, everyone. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Madeline Hoffman. I'm the chair of the New Jersey Peace Council and also a former candidate for U.S. Senate on the Green Party ticket. And so, <laughs> Yeah, 25,000 plus, a little bit more. Um, uh, very glad to see everyone here tonight for this program uh, that we, uh, the New Jersey Peace Council and the U.S. Peace Council and others have been working on for a number of months now uh, because on uh, March 30th or the April 4th, March 30th to May April 4th, we're going, it's going to be a week of actions against NATO. Uh, NATO every year celebrates another anniversary, and this year is the 70th anniversary of the NATO alliance, and this year they chose to hold <coughs> their event in Washington, D.C., and the actual date that they're meeting is April 4th. Most of you probably, when I say April 4th, think of something very dramatic and very important that happened in this country. April 4th, 1967, Dr. Martin Luther King gave his Beyond Vietnam, Breaking the Silence, Why I Opposed the Vietnam War speech. And then exactly one year later, April 4th, 1968, Dr. King was assassinated. So the fact that this year's NATO alliance meeting, whatever form it takes, is going to be on April 4th in Washington, D.C., seemed like a slap in the face and an insult to the work of Dr. King because, as you all know, uh, Dr. King talked about the greatest purveyor of violence in the world being the United States, and he also talked about the need to eliminate the three evils, the triple evils of racism, poverty, and militarism. And here we have NATO coming in on that very day uh, to celebrate, maybe for them, uh, their 70 years of death and destruction around the planet. So this is a particularly, time, particularly timely um, event to hold. Since we started to plan the event, we started to hear January 23rd, uh, Trump and company recognized uh, Guaido as the legitimate president of Venezuela. Of course, not legitimate at all, but even that, even the, uh, event, the events that are happening in Venezuela tied to NATO because neighboring Colombia is a partner, global partner of NATO, and if anything is going to happen militarily, in Venezuela, it's likely to, to begin in Colombia. And so we've added, we, we have to talk about Venezuela as well as all the, the 70 years of previous uh, activities of this NATO alliance and call for its elimination and an end to NATO. So very honored, very pleased to have Ajamu Baraka here today and also Bam and Azad. We're going to have um, Ajamu is going to begin. Bauman is going to speak after. Ajamu is an executive committee member of the U.S. Peace Council, and he's also the national coordinator for the Black Alliance for Peace. And you all probably know him too, since there's a lot of Greens here in the in the audience as a 2016 vice presidential candidate. So we're very honored to have Ajamu Baraka address us on NATO and, well, actually his, the official title of his presentation is Confronting the Empire's War Agenda, the Struggle for Peace and Social Justice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. And um, thank all of you for coming out this evening for we hope to 
have a very uh, important and very um, <laughs> rich conversation. <laughs> we, um, we are involved in a, um, a mini tour. The objective of this tour is to uh, build support for the actions that are coming up in, in March. Uh, but the objective also is to not just mobilize opposition in these very important uh, actions, but to uh, suggest to the people of this country that we have to, have to do more than just mobilization, that building effective and powerful organizations is a, a, critical, uh, uh, in, in a critical objective that we have to realize because those of us who are here in the center of, of empire, we are the only force that can put a break on the kind of, of madness that we have witnessed here in this country for the last couple of decades. So we, we start off with our, our call, our call to, to the people. We say all power to the people. Power to the people. All power to the people. Power, All power to, to the people. people. That has to be the objective. Mm. We say to uh, our friends um, across the country that at this critical moment, we pose a serious question. As we see that the U.S. is um, involved in destabilization uh, with the possibility of war in Venezuela, uh, we see this coming on the heels of what has been a veritable rampage on the part of this state across the so-called Middle East, mm -hmm. displacing millions of people, over a million people who have now lost their lives. And so we say to the people of this country, how much war? How much more death and destruction will you endure before you break with the capitalist duopoly of your government and say no more war, no more subversion, no more killings in my name by a state that by every definition has become a rogue state and a threat to global humanity. That's the task that we have before us, my friends. The people of this country are decent people. They've just been manipulated down to their very bones. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it is that ba basic decency that's been weaponized by the state using this weapon of humanitarian intervention mm -hmm. and the responsibility mm -hmm. to protect. But underneath this concept is a very contradictory set of values. In this ideal that the U.S. has the right to go and save other peoples using any means necessary, we see that what we see is that this is a cover for the continuation of a historic project. Mm -hmm. The project, the continued project of white supremacist domination. And the very fact that a, a, a argument can be made that the U.S. has a right and a responsibility to go into a sovereign nation unilaterally to determine, to determine the leadership of that state without significant opposition from the U.S. public, it really uh, reflects the level of, of not only depravity, but also the extent in which these notions of the U.S. having that kind of right and responsibility has been inculcated in the culture and in the consciousness of people here in this country. The very fact that you have this kind of move, which is objectively a, a gangster move. You, we might recall, and if you don't recall, you may have, uh, have studied in history. How many people know about or remember or studied the um, uh, Bay of Pigs, the invasion of Cuba by the U.S. Now, we remember that this was a covert operation, correct? No one knew about it. They trained, they put together that force, they trained them, 
Uh, they placed them on the beach. And in fact, uh, when they uh, met the resistance of the Cuban people, and they were calling for uh, air support uh, from the U.S. government, uh, John Kennedy decided that that was too risky to uh, provide direct air support because that would expose the fact that the U.S. was the primary force that created that invasion and was supporting it. They wanted to perpetuate the fiction that this was some kind of independent action on the part of 1,500 Cubans. Fast forward to today. <laughs> they don't have to operate in the shadows. They have announced, basically, without any legal justification, both in terms of international law and even U.S. constitutional law, they have said, basically, we have decided that the uh, government of Venezuela is illegal, that uh, it, they, they lack democracy, and therefore we're going to uh, subvert the government, and if they don't allow this uh, humanitarian aid to come in, we're going to basically push ourselves into this sovereign nation using any means necessary to make uh, an effect regime change. A straight up gangster move that's supported by apparently most of the people in this country. So it shows you how far we have, have come, if you will, or degenerated in terms of uh, international and national morality. That basically now they can uh, do whatever they want to do to advance their interests with the support of most of the people in this country. So what we see, my friends, is a uh, behavior that is a uh, behavior that is, is, is defined as a rogue state, rogue behavior, rogue, is, rogue statism, if you will. The definition of a, of a rogue state, a nation or state regarded as breaking international law and posing a threat to the security of other nations. That's a rogue state. Now, I don't know about you, but to me it seems like that is a classic definition of what we see unfolding here in this country with the U.S. state. So we say to progressives, we say to people of conscience, there is no objective right bestowed upon the United States of America by either God or a human that grants the U.S. the right and responsibility to intrude and to impose his will on other people. Yeah. We must categorically reject, categorically reject this arrogant white supremacist assumption that the U.S. is itself a capitalist dictatorship can presume it has the right to make these kinds of changes. A uh, U.S. that uh, has a so-called democratic process in which a candidate can uh, outpace another candidate by three million votes and still lose. A democracy in which uh, a major political party can engage in systematic vote suppression. A democracy in which a so-called constitutional right or constitutional protections against an oppressed national uh, minority through a uh, name the Voting Rights Act can be eliminated with no opposition. A democracy in which they engage in systematic voter suppression where people are sent to prison, and when they come out, they, are have, they no longer have the right to participate in the so-called democracy. If the U.S. was concerned about democracy, the first place they should be looking at is here in this country. So my friends, we have a responsibility. We have to build a movement. Uh, we have to shift power from these maniacs 
uh, to the masses of the people. But that is why we started to engage in the process of building this Black Alliance for Peace. The Black Alliance for Peace is an organization that's committed to peace, of course. What rational person would be opposed to peace? But we understand that there can be no peace without justice. Therefore, this alliance is a fighting formation. We understand that we're not going to have peace as long as power resides in the hands of these maniacs. And we're not just talking about the Trump administration. That's an easy target. We talk about the fact that Trump is no more than a symptom of, the, of, a, of a disease. That this uh, oppressive system is based on the bipartisan collaboration mm -hmm. of both of these capitalist uh, racist parties. Mm -hmm. That both of these parties uh, uh, support the imperialist agenda. Mm -hmm. That's why there's no opposition to this gangster move on Venezuela. The Democrats uh, criticize Donald Trump. They call him everything you can imagine. But when it comes to a move against Venezuela or uh, a concern about whether or not Trump might uh, strike some kind of peace deal with uh, North Korea, then basically, you know, either they will support Trump in Venezuela or they'll try to undermine him when it comes to a situation like North Korea. So he's a liar and a charlatan, but when it comes to him declaring that he has a, a, a concern about the humanity of people in Venezuela, then we're supposed to believe that. I mean, it's absolutely absurd. But yet you see that all of the corporate media that go along with that, they're basically uh, uh, pushing the notion that uh, uh, Trump is correct on Venezuela, um, and it's only a few people in the in the uh, Congress, a few uh, uh, Democrats, uh, that have spoken out on this situation in a very strong and clear way. But they are in the vast minority. So we've got to understand if we are concerned with peace, if we are opposed to this kind of, of gangsterism. Um, that is, is motivated by imperialist objectives, the only force that can put a break on this kind of activity is, in fact, the people. So we started building this Black Alliance for Peace. The Black Alliance for Peace is an organization that is against war, repression, and imperialism. We are opposed to war and imperialism externally, but also opposed to domestic repression here internally. We understand that there's a link between the gangsterism and war mongering externally and the war being waged against African people and, and, and oppressed people here in this country. We say that basically um, U.S. exceptionalism and Trump's Make America Great are two sides of the same white supremacist imperialist coin. That this is part of the same system a system that's organized to uh, degrade and dehumanize people in the U.S. and to degrade, dehumanize, and exploit people globally. We understand that this system and its rulers are prepared to fight to the last drop of your blood and mine mm -hmm. in order to maintain their dominance, but we've got to fight them. <laughs> So we're not just concerned with U.S. imperialism. We're concerned with the entire uh, structure of dominance. We are opposed to the bipartisan uh, pivot to Asia. We're concerned with an opposed uh, rotating of NATO troops on the borders of Russia. The destabilization and militarization of Africa under the U.S. Africa Command. We are opposed to the role of the Israeli state in providing training to police forces across this country. 
We are opposed to the Department of Defense's 1033 program. How many people know about that program? The program that is primarily responsible for militarizing police forces oh, yeah. across this country. Right, no, I know. I didn't know the number. They have uh, transferred something like $4.1 billion in terms of uh, military equipment from the federal government to police forces across this country. Yeah. Equipment that's then used in the war against black folks and the working class in general. Okay? So we are opposed to the 1033 program. So we make those connections, my friends. We make those links. Uh, we stand with the uh, globalized, uh, colonized uh, people uh, in the global south who are fighting for authentic decolonization and national self-determination. And in that stand, we have to identify who our friends and who our enemies are. We've got to be clear about that. We all have to be clear about that. When we see the decision made by the European Parliament a few weeks ago uh, that uh, declared that they were going to support the Juan Guaido mm -hmm. as the so-called legitimate uh, president of Venezuela, mm -hmm. that was not a surprise for us. Mm -hmm because we had already recognized that basically there is a, a structural, ideological, philosophical, and emotional, and psychological connection between the U.S. settler state and the European Union. So we say basically that we are opposed to what we call the U.S., E.U., NATO axis of domination. <laughs> That is, my friends, the common enemy. That is the common enemy. And we've got to name the common enemy. So Venezuela is basically the latest example, the latest expression of this bipartisan unity to advance the interests of this axis of domination. This axis of domination is part of, it is the, the operationalization of the pan-European white supremacist, colonial, capitalist patriarchy that emerged uh, beginning in 1492. So we're clear about these connections. And we understand <laughs> that we can't have an effective anti-imperialist uh, movement, an anti-imperialist fight. We can't uh, talk about uh, class uh, consciousness and class unity without addressing these kinds of contradictions. There can be no class unity unless people are prepared to deal with the consequences and reality of white supremacy. If we don't deal with that effectively, then of course the enemy will deal with that. And we see the results of that across Europe mm -hmm. and in this country. Mm -hmm. That's the basis of the neo-fascist movement that's developing. Mm -hmm. And if you don't address that, then basically you are in essence feeding into it. So Venezuela is the latest expression of this madness. Uh, we mentioned the fact that we've seen what the U.S. has been involved in for the last two decades. We have to remind people um, in this country, and we remind people specifically among African people in this country, about what happens when you don't resist U.S. intervention in these various countries. Uh, we have to remind people that in Venezuela, uh, objectively, uh, about 52% of that population, if you use the racial categories that we have in this country, about 52% of that population would be classified as black. So we're talking about an attack on, in essence, a black nation. So we remind people of what happened uh, the last time the U.S. intervened militarily in a largely people of color nation in Latin America. Does anybody remember what that, what that nation was the last time we had a direct military intervention here Panama. in Latin America? Panama. Panama. 1989. Mm -hmm. They went into effect of uh, an arrest. The U.S. is going to go into another country and arrest the leader of that country in 1989. Okay? 
they made El Chirillo, a, a community 90% uh, black, in essence a free fire zone because there was some barracks of the, of the, of the uh, Panamanian, Panamanian military in that community. And the result of that intervention resulted in three to 5,000 people dying. The majority of those people being black. We know that if the military goes into, into Venezuela, if they are successful in igniting um, a war in Venezuela, uh, because the, the bulk of the support for the Bolivarian process are with black people and brown people, that it's going to be black people who will disproportionately die as a consequence of any war in Venezuela. But that's not our main concern. We're concerned about humanity in general. But well, we have to let people understand the racial component of this also. This is, these are just objective realities we have to deal with. So we have to fight back, my friends. We have to build this movement. Uh, we've got to uh, find the basis of unity across the various struggles. Uh, there are things that are being organized right now uh, to assist us in this fight back. Um, the immediate um, mobilization is taking place March 16th in Washington. Uh, many of you may have heard about that. This is a, a, a national mobilization to oppose the intervention. We have uh, a bus. And there's a bus being organized here uh, in this city, and that's fantastic. Uh, two weeks after that mobilization, we are organizing a, um, a, 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 an event in Washington again on March 30th. With the, there you go. <laughs> that basically what Thanks, we have to do, we are targeting NATO. You know, we said NATO's part of this axis of domination, okay? So March 30th, we're going back to DC as part of our opposition to NATO, okay? Um, this work that we're doing on NATO to oppose NATO as a white supremacist structure uh, again, it's part of that axis of domination. Um, it is part of a, a effort that we have organized uh, uh, with other uh, groups here in this country uh, to create a coalition that is targeting uh, NATO, an international campaign uh, to oppose NATO and all of NATO's bases. That campaign um, emerged out of a coalition that was built here in this country. And Bowman's going to talk about that some more. Uh, a conference we had last January, uh, in which we came out of that conference with a new coalition, the coalition to close all U.S. foreign bases. And then the, the international campaign came, uh, came what was organized in November of last year. And out of that conference, we came out with the international campaign to close all U.S. Uh, foreign bases and NATO bases. So these are the efforts we have to engage in and the activities between March uh, 30th and April 4th are activities to help to educate people in this country on the role of NATO uh, and to oppose NATO and to build support for all of our work around closing NATO, shutting down the AFRICOM or the U.S. African Command, make, making the link between uh, imperialism and domestic repression, uh, these are the kinds of things we have to do in order to, to build an effective fight back uh, to oppose this madness. The last thing, and I'm going to sit down after this. Whatever one's uh, opinions may be about uh, related to the electoral process, uh, we think in the Black Alliance of Peace is that if we're going to defeat those triplets of racism and, and materialism and militarism, um, we've got to make this issue of war and militarism uh, an issue in the national discourse around the electoral process in 2020. So we, say, we say that we, we have some proposals that if a candidate or if a representative wants to continue in office, mm -hmm. 
that we, 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 we suggest some, some positions that they must take in order to win the support of the population, in order to win our votes. We say that all candidates must support efforts to cut uh, the military budget by 50% as a start. Use those resources to fully fund social programs that address issues of education and housing, to develop uh, green jobs and health care uh, to people in this country. We say that these candidates must commit to passing resolutions at every level of government to bring the U.S. in alignment with international law and the United Nations Charter. We say they must promote the closing of the over 800 to 1,000 bases, U.S. bases. They must call for and work to close the U.S. Africa Command, AFRICOM, and withdraw all U.S. military personnel from Africa. They must commit to, in, to ending the uh, militarization of police forces through the Department of Defense 1033 program. <laughs> and demand that the uh, Department of Justice document and investigate all instances of use of lethal, le le lethal force against non-white populations as demanded by various human rights treaty monitoring bodies. They must advocate that the U.S. adhere to the United Nations Resolution of July 2017 to eliminate all nuclear weapons globally. So my friends, this is what we have to do. We have to build a powerful movement, but understanding the limitations and the challenges we have uh, before us to do that. But we are up to the task. You know, we cannot uh, determine the kinds of conditions that we are born into, <clears throat> that we face uh, as human beings. But we can determine how we respond to those conditions. And for many of us, and for most of you in this room, we have decided that we are going to struggle. We're going to fight. We're going to you know, oppose injustice. So my friends, let's uh, take up that responsibility. Let's go to the to the public. Let's educate the people on these kinds of situations with Venezuela, with NATO. Uh, let's help the people understand that they, in fact, have the power to make change. That the enemy will try to make us think that we don't have the power. That uh, there is no alternative. But we have a responsibility to envision something beyond this to be committed to, to building a world that transcends this kind, of, this kind of madness. So my friends, we are clear about what we have to do. Let's go out, let's do it, let's build this movement, and let's win back this world for ourselves. Right. Thank you. to invite the audience to ask questions when all the speaking is done. Uh, we, only, we only have two speakers, so it won't be another hour or two before questions. But if you have the questions, jot them down so you don't forget. Um, and you know we were talking about this a little bit before. Uh, there's another war on the horizon that most people are not talking about, and that's India-Pakistan. Uh, we've and just the other day, uh, I read about the, first the India, the plane from India going into Pakistan, and then Pakistan shooting down India uh, airlines from India, and then I'm not sure where it's gone from there. But this is all while we're talking about Venezuela, Korea, um, Iran. Iran, Israel, and Palestine, 
You know, all of our attention is rightfully focused on these, on these areas of the world. But at the same time, this is happening. There's another area that we need to keep an eye out on, particularly since both India and Pakistan have nuclear weapons. And so if there's the wrong move or the wrong word or the, the wrong you know, glance made, um, we could be, this could be very deadly for everyone. So uh, it's in this context, I mean, we are the madness, the rogue state, not quite sure what the role of the United States is and all that yet, but it doesn't matter. I mean, whatever, wherever there is war and wherever there is this kind of possibility, we have to pay attention. I just also wanted to say, I was at, and Diane Moxley also, we were at the, uh, the conference in Baltimore that Ajamu mentioned, and one thing out of that is after the conference to, to build this, uh, this campaign, the national campaign, to close foreign U.S. military bases, we saw a newspaper. I think it was, it was in the middle of January. It was bitter cold. And the front page of the newspaper had the school children of Baltimore sitting in the school. Well, Tom was there also, um, Tom Violet. The school children were sitting in the classroom in Baltimore with jackets, hats, and scarves on because there wasn't enough money in the school system to pay for the heat in bitter, bitter cold in, in, um, in Baltimore. So what Ajamu said at the, with the, the list of demands and the 50% cut and moving all that money uh, into social programs, social needs, is extremely important. Okay, so our next speaker is Bahman Azad. He's the organizational secretary of the U.S. Peace Council, one of the, the, the group that has hosted uh, Ajamu for the last couple of days and into tomorrow. Three, city, uh, three state tour, Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. And Bauman is also the coordinator of the global campaign to close US and NATO military bases. And it's an easy name, not an easy name, but it's a straightforward name to, to, to say, but it's not as easy as it sounds to bring people together from all over the world with all kinds of points of view about how to address these problems and get them all to pull in the same direction. Um, very, very difficult and very challenging. But it was done. And so we're now in that, in that position to move forward. And I introduce to you, Bam and Azad. Good evening, everyone. It's nice to be here with you. Thank you for coming. Um, I want to add some, some dimensions to what Ajamu said regarding the need for organizing and working together. Um, the blatant violations mm -hmm. that the United States is committing everywhere around the world um, is not the result of its strength. Mm -hmm. Usually such powers become when they act this way when they are more desperate. Mm. A secure system of domination doesn't need these kinds of actions. So we know that the system is deteriorating, right? Mm -hmm. What we need to do is now is to build a movement to make sure it happens. <laughs> and this is what we have been doing, especially the US Peace Council. And I want to bring that to you the background of where, how we managed, because it was a difficult task, as Madeline mentioned. One thing we should remember, a minority, oppressive minority organized can always rule over a majority unorganized. Mm -hmm. And this is the situation we're dealing with. And, we, and that shows the path to, to solving the problem we're facing. And Ajamu emphasized that and mentioned that, and I think uh, I'm building on top of that. Well, our peace movement, I think there's a lot of sincere effort happening all over the place in the United States. A lot of dedication. One problem, we are acting as separate contingents. We, do, we are not a unified force. 
and that is our weakness. A lot of our energies are lost in the middle of this separation. And this has been the motto of U.S. Peace Council from the beginning. And I want to mention additional dimensions to it, just to set the stage for what I'm trying to say. And that is the U.S. Peace Council that we're working on. U.S. Peace Council has certain features that a few other organizations have in the United States. And I want to mention that. I reduce it to three, at least. First, it's one of the few anti-imperialist peace organizations in the United States. There is a difference between fighting against injustice but not knowing who the enemy is and knowing where it's coming from and focusing on where to attack, what element, what force. Understanding imperialism is key to the success of the peace movement. That's one element. The second element is that the U.S. Peace Council is a part of a global movement. U.S. Peace Council is a member of the World Peace Council, which has an observer status in the United Nations, and I'll be representing them in the UN. They were formed, the World Peace Council was formed, after World War II, to stop any possibility of another war like that, maintaining peace and fighting nuclear weapons, the developments that had happened. We are part of a network of close to 100 national peace organizations from different parts of the world. And we are acting as a unified international force. That is very important because if you know, I'm sure you know, imperialist forces work in unison. Mm -hmm. They are well organized. They are working together. EU, NATO, United States, right? Act as one, everywhere. But we are not. So we need a global peace movement that is unified. That's why U.S. Peace Council is part of this global network. I would say none of the other organizations, peace organizations in the United States are linked internationally that way. Finally, understanding the centrality of the concept of imperialism, which for us is a system, it's not this leader or that leader or this party or that party, because for the past decades, whoever has been in office or in control has fo followed the same imperialist foreign policy all over, right? So it's not based on that, it's the system that makes that kind of requirement that the leaders have to respond to. Look at, look at how the system responded when Trump said, I want to pull out the US <laughs> troops out of Syria. Mm -hmm. It is a system that's resisting it, right? Knowing all that, knowing the need for unity, US Peace Council has always operated on the principle that the unity of all forces is the precondition for the success. None of us can do it alone. No single organization or group of organization, neither just left or center, can do it. We have to bring forces together. And this has been the agenda that for us ever since it was formed and the U.S. Peace Council was formed. Now, it is based on that principle, these principles, that we, when this U.S., the, the process that we are in right now, when the U.S. attacked Syria and started to impose a regime change, we tried to approach other forces in the peace movement. Let us work together, unite, and fight against this intervention. But you know what kind of response? Of course, there were forces like Black Alliance, like um, I mean, elements of Black Alliance at the time it didn't exist, I suppose, right? Um, Ajam himself. Um, other forces that work closely with us, Veterans for Peace. Um, 
they joined us. But the rest of the peace movement, the center forces, what we call them, refused. And you know what their excuse was? Both sides are bad. Assad is bad. U.S. is bad. We don't want to take sides. So silence was the result. Right? But what they missed was a pattern that has been happening throughout. Look at previous wars. Anyone that becomes a target in a country that becomes a target, first of all, as Ajamu previously mentioned in other meetings, they shrink the whole country into one leader. Right? As if it's just one person. Right? Then, start to demonize. Right? Evil. Bad. Dictator. Right? Then combine it with sanctions to weaken the country. Right? And once the condition is ripe, they move in. This has been repeatedly happening before our eyes. And we're still silent about the new one that comes up. That's what happened with regard to Syria. So we decided we have to do something serious. We organized a peace delegation to Syria. It was the first time U.S. was sending, from the U.S. A delegation was going there. Our delegation went neither. Madeline was part of it. <laughs> You paid the price for it, of course. Yes, I did. <laughs> yes, I did. Um, they met with everybody, all parts of society, all segments, all groups, all <coughs> parliamentarians, uh, uh, government organizational uh, people, ministers, uh, women's attorneys, everywhere, even faculty members and students, women's organizations, and everything. And even at the end, they met with President Assad for two hours. And they came back, and we had a press conference at the United Nations. Blew up the whole idea of dictatorship, criminal Assad, and all these things. And we were attacked. Seriously. Very nasty. Wait. Let me tell you some of the terms they used against us. They drank Assad's Kool-Aid. They are a front for Communist Party. They are Putinized. So they attacked us. So we decided that we cannot fight back alone if the whole gang is doing this. So we tried to bring our forces together. Okay, that was the first time that we brought a few of these organizations together, including the Transport Peace, UNAC, uh, and a few others, and, and uh, created what is known as Hands of Syria Coalition. And it was very successful in pushing back and changing the whole environment about Syria. But the success of that project led us to something else. Well, if this can be done on such a narrow and controversial issue on Syria, why not broaden it? Right? What topic can we find that has the support of the majority of people? What subject in peace? Issues. And we decided that regardless of where peace movement stands and what reasons, whether they agree on the concept of imperialism or not, we think that uniting people against foreign military bases of the United States would be the best way to go to bring the forces together because 95% of forces agree on it for various reasons. Some of them are because they're against, they're against imperialism. Some of them, they're talking about waste of resources that could be used for public um, support. Some people fought against it or were opposed to it because of the destruction. They were advanced guards of the wars that they they they, they developed get into every once in a while. They use all those bases. And people don't pay much attention. But the destruction of environment. Mm -hmm. Foreign bases are one of the main, main reasons. Pentagon is the main primary consumer of fossil fuel. Mm -hmm. Pentagon is the main polluter of the environment in the world. We have to understand that. And that brings all the forces together. Environmentalists, social justice people, right? Peace people. 
And that's how it started. And we managed to bring people from both sides of the divide of the, within the peace movement together <coughs> for that. And the success was the conference that came out of that in January of 2018. Right? And I'm happy to see some people like Diane and Madeline and others who were there. Um, and again, it was a resolution passing that meeting in that conference that called for globalization of that campaign. So we came up with a global campaign concept, and we worked on it, and it took a long time. And I explained to you what the difficulties are. Madeline mentioned something in passing. You know, bringing forces together in the United States is already very difficult, <laughs> right? Just imagine the international level, which is actually suffering from the remnants of the Cold War still, right? Anti-imperialist forces on one side, and the European Social Democrats on the other side, who were opposed to the socialist camp, right? And peace forces belonging to this side were never willing to work with the other side, and vice versa. No trust. There was an ideological divide, right? And we had to bring these forces together. We fought, we argued, we insisted that those forces that are on the social democratic side to join this global campaign. And their condition for joining was, if you add the threats of Russian bases and Chinese bases, we will join. Okay, and we refused. We refused. Not because we are not opposed to all bases. We have said it in our unity statement. But because we consider NATO and US as the main threat, mm -hmm. the most urgent thing that we have to respond to. It's not Russia waging wars across the globe. It's not China. It's the United States and NATO. 95% right. of all bases around the world belong to US and NATO. as I, I think some of the speakers that you mentioned, NATO and US have 20 times more bases than the rest of the countries combined in the world. So that's the main threat. But the negotiations went on and on and on for six, seven months. And finally, after a lot of sub-organizations of their network joined us, they realized they left alone. So they finally signed on and came to our Dublin conference. That was the most important, significant victory toward the unity of the peace movement. And we are trying to build on it. Okay. Um, of course, we have been a bit delayed because of all these urgent emergency things that come up. Right? Our work toward making a, um, this March 30th has been the focus on NATO, right? But suddenly, Venezuela issue arrives, right? And it's in a sense overshadowing because it's a most very urgent issue. Right? We have no complaint. So we have to combine our efforts because it's also NATO, don't forget, Colombia has become a global <coughs> partner of NATO. It is Colombia that is being used as a venue to overthrow the Venezuelan government. So it's in fact, Venezuela, Colombia is acting on behalf of NATO. And this is important, please pay attention. Since the collapse of Soviet Union, NATO has been expanding eastward. This is the first time they're moving westward into Latin America. Mm -hmm. This is the threat in our backyard, right? In our hemisphere. This is the first time and they're studying it with the war on Venezuela. So in many ways, Venezuelan issue is directly linked to NATO and, 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 and EU and, and axis of domination. So. so we have to deal with it together, and that's what we're trying to do. I want to mention a couple of events and close, and then they let you uh, One, 
World Peace Council is having its own anti-NATO conference on 31st of March in Washington, D.C. They usually have that. Every time NATO has a meeting, they have their own counter meeting. So we are organizing um, that conference. We have delegates possibly, uh, we know for sure, coming from Argentina and other places, from Nepal possibly. They are looking for visas if they allow them to come in. Uh, we have a lot of good speakers, including Hajamu Baraka. Um, <laughs> Jerry Condon, President of Veterans for Peace. Um, Kevin Zies, Margaret Flowers, Margaret Kimberly, hopefully, if her work allows, and a few others. So it's gonna be a high-powered anti-NATO conference from 3 to 7 p.m. on Sunday of that weekend. <coughs> the second most, I mean, not the second in terms of importance, thing I want to announce uh, is that the U.S. Peace Council, based on that whole concept of unity, we have put together a second delegation, peace delegation, to Venezuela. <laughs> they are going to Caracas from March 10th to 15th. Again, Ajamu is going to be leading that delegation for us. Mm -hmm. Kevin and Margaret are going to be on it. Uh, Joe Lombardo, Sarah. Flounders, um, Jerry Condon, we have labor leaders going, the president of Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, U.S. section is going to be on it, and a few others. Fifteen member delegation is going to Venezuela. Okay. And we had a press conference yesterday, right, at the United Nations. You can find it on UN Web TV, and it's on U.S. Peace Council website and our Facebook page. You can see that and watch it. I'll give you a few email addresses, I mean web addresses for this. Our website is uspeacecouncil.org. Our Facebook is facebook.com slash uspeacecouncil. <laughs> Our anti-NATO campaign is no number two nato2019.org. We we'll keep updating this information uh, areas and please if you want to follow and lastly I want to invite all of you to join the US Peace Council mm -hmm. Madeline is trying to build up our forces in New Jersey and I'm sure she will be happy if you all join thank you very much Before we go into question and answer, um, I thought that Bauman was going to mention it, so I don't have all the details, but I know that we have two buses that we're organizing. Bob, wait, raise your hand. Bob Wotanik has already put money down for the bus going on, on March 16th and needs people to buy seats either for themselves or other people who want to go to the action uh, to, for U.S. hands off of Venezuela on the 16th. So if you want more information, you can talk to him before you leave. The phone number is right on the banner. Right, the phone number is right, 908-881-5275. He also put down, or will, will if, we, if we agree to it, not as a general body, but if we talk, some of us talk about it later, put money down for um, March 30th um, because we've been talking about taking a bus down on the 30th uh, to the anti-NATO event and he's already volunteered to help us get uh, to get started on that. So I would talk to him about both. Yes. Talk to me. Also, if you're going to go on the 30th, talk to me and we, help, we can... If we can't fill the bus, we'll take vans, but let's try to fill one bus. No, we're, we're, we're filling the bus. We're filling the bus. <laughs> He's the positive voice. I'm the, if we can, if we can. <laughs> and I, I, if I could just add, aside from the, the suggested for the 16th is 50, discounted 40, but I want to make very clear, we've been getting very, very substantial contributions from folks who aren't going to be on the bus. 
So pretty much it's a sliding scale all the way down to almost zero. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you got the day and you don't have the, the bread, you're gonna, you can still get on the bus. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Yeah, and if you can't get on the bus, but you have money to contribute, because you want to see it succeed, you can also just donate to the seats on the bus. That'll be for both buses. Both, both buses. Yes. It's pretty hard. You know, the world has thrown us so much that we have two marches on Washington, D.C. in two weeks. So we got to get, get busy to organize the kind of movement that both Ajamu, Ajamu and Bauman were talking about. 16th is warm up. <laughs> well, they're all, yeah, they're all important for different reasons. Okay, so uh, I wanted to open this up for questions. Okay, uh, there's a microphone here for you to ask your questions. So that can be recorded. We're live, we've been live streaming, in case you didn't realize it. I don't know, Fred, are you live streaming or recording? Okay, so we have one uh, just straight recording and one live stream. Uh, so, I guess if you have a question, raise your, come up to the front and grab the mic. Brian will give you the mic and you can address any one of the three of us. Uh, I guess this is primarily to Ashamu. If you could uh, perhaps talk a little bit about uh, Haiti and how that factors into what's happening in Venezuela. Thank you, Tom. Now, we, we have a uh, I urge you to take our statement. Uh, uh, we have a, a statement where we make the connection between uh, Haiti and Venezuela. Um, I'm not going to go into the, 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 the long history of that connection, but very briefly, um, people need to know that without Haiti and the Haitian Revolution, there probably would not be a Venezuela today. That the uh, revolutionary process uh, led by Simone Boulevard uh, was given material support uh, by the Haitian state uh, once it, it won its independence. Uh, so there's a, a long historical connection between those two states. In the contemporary period, that connection is still there. That basically um, the uh, uh, Venezuelan state provided substantial support to Haiti, especially during the period where um, uh, petroleum was going for like over $100 a barrel. Um, uh, Venezuela provided support to Haiti and a number of other states to get them through that very tough period. Haiti and Venezuela are key to the anti-colonial process here in the, in the so-called Americas. Haiti, with its history, its, its size in the Caribbean, and of course, Venezuela being the tip of the spear for the uh, revolutionary process here in, uh, here, uh, down in Latin America, in South America. So it is quite interesting that as uh, the focus is on Venezuela and the people of Venezuela are, are resisting, at the same time, we see that there's a resistant movement in Haiti uh, to the extent that basically there's a real possibility that the Haitian people may be able to get rid of its U.S. imposed president in that country. So this, is, this is all connected to the, 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 the kinds of fundamental changes taking place here um, as a consequence of the, the, the overreach of the U.S. state. Uh, and the fact that people are understanding that they have the power to transform themselves and to transform their conditions. Uh, and that's what we're seeing in Haiti. That's what we're seeing in Venezuela with resistance to U.S. imperialism. And that, those are the movements that we have to support on this side. Okay. Uh, next question. Next question. Hi. Uh, so this question is to anyone who wants to answer, or to all of you. Uh, there's some uh, amongst us, or maybe not in the room, but they work with us at various coalitions that maybe are opposed to U.S. militarism, but are not sold on dismantling the NATO alliance. I'm wondering if, yeah. if you could talk directly to that, because maybe 
Um, you know, a lot of us growing up in the U.S. school system, after we're in college, we're, it's kind of drilled into us the, the deterrence logic of NATO, that NATO uh, exists to prevent war with, with <laughs> Russia, right? So I'm wondering if, if you could talk um, directly to that and how um, the relationship between U.S. militarism and NATO and what the impact of dismantling the NATO alliance would be. And before uh, our speakers answer that, if you if you have to leave or even if you don't, yes. please make sure you sign up. You. We have your name on a sign up sheet, yeah. and uh, there at the front. And then I have another announcement, but I'll wait until after this question is answered. Who's first? Well, look, it's it's. Um, I think that was that, that was a very important question that that is the kind of propaganda that we are exposed to uh, in this country. But we have to ask the question to, to, the, to the public. Do you, do you understand the original uh, mission of NATO? And even if you understand the mission to be uh, uh, a mission that was supposed to be in opposition to the supposed military expansion objectives of the Soviet Union, why do we still have a, a NATO when the Soviet Union has disappeared? Right. right. We see that basically it, the, the elimination of, of, or the disappearance of the Soviet Union and the continuation of NATO really exposes the real nature of NATO. Right. NATO is a, a, a structure of, of Western dominance, a structure uh, that, is, that we define as part of the uh, global structures of white power, white supremacy. Uh, and we have seen that it's been used in that way as an instrument to, uh, to safeguard and to expand uh, U.S. and European domination. The attack that uh, took place uh, on the African continent, destroying the most prosperous nation on the African continent, Libya, was a U.S. and NATO operation. What does NATO have to do that's supposed to be defending Europe in Africa? Well, because it's the tip of the spear for U.S. and European imperialism. So dismantling that structure is, a, is, is a, a primary objective of anybody who is uh, committed to ridding the world of these kinds of, of militaristic uh, uh, organizations. That if you really believe in the possibility of peace, then you have to, we have to delegitimize these kinds of structures. And we know it's a very difficult task because, you know, part of the confusion in this country uh, related to the role of Donald Trump is that anything that Donald Trump may be opposed to, then uh, the Democrats uh, and liberals uh, and, and uh, radicals who really are liberals uh, will then uh, side with. So if Donald Trump is raising questions about, about NATO, then the Democrats are saying, well, we support NATO. Well, yeah, In yeah. fact, we're going to pass legislation yeah. to make it impossible for the U.S. to withdraw from NATO. Yeah. So part of what we have to do as we prepare for March 30th is to, in fact, educate the public. Not just for March 30th, because we won't be able to successfully do that uh, before March 30th, but after March 30th to expose the true nat nature of this, this uh, uh, structure uh, and to suggest to people who are committed to peace, who, are, uh, who understand the importance of, of taking a, a position against uh, imperialism, that we've got to oppose NATO. Yeah, sure. I would like to add another dimension to this. Um, NATO was created, so-called, to defend Europe against possible Soviet invasion, yeah. right? Um, NATO, the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Russia is a capitalist society yeah. like the United States, right? right? Yeah. They're just competing with each other. Yeah. They're not enemies. So the threat is not there. But NATO is still there. Not only that, it has grown, expanded. For what? They're redefining their mission now, creating a new one for themselves to survive. But I want to add one dimension to it. The boss of NATO is the United States. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
right? Right. These others are just tentacles of the octopus. But there are conditions. If you want to join NATO, you have to spend a certain amount of your GDP on military and on weapons. Right? So, I don't think Colombia, as a, as a partner of NATO, can push for a war that the United States doesn't want, right? To follow its own. They are all listening to what, where U.S. wants to fight. But they have to pay for the war that U.S. wants to fight, mm. right? So they are the, taking away the resources from their own people. It's become a source of exploitation of the populations. And who, where does that money go to? U.S. armed manufacturers, right? It's another extortion. Why should they exist? That's the question. People don't know this. People of Europe know very well from, about this. But on, in the United States, in the belly of the beast, people don't know because that's exactly a, a secret that must be kept. I'm, I'm going to add here uh, Yemen and the whole debate and discussion about whether the United States should continue to provide weapons to Saudi Arabia for the devastation that's going on by Saudi Arabia with U.S. backing uh, in Yemen. And I just read how the legislators were playing games with that. It passed the House, yeah. the, the resolution did, but there was added to it a resolution um, against anti-Semitism. Now, anti-Semitism, we, we have to be aware of it and fight against it. But then when the bill went from the House to the Senate, the Senate parliamentarian said, well, no, this no longer has the privilege status it had before, so we don't have to vote on it because it has this added piece about anti-Semitism. So if it's going to move forward, it's going to have to start again, this time in the Senate, and go to the House and it, goes back, it bounces back and forth. When people are dying every day, when children are dying every day in Yemen, our legislators are playing games with something that would stop and prevent the arms sales to Yemen. That's one. Second, when talking about military bases as, potential, as an act of aggression, Okinawa, the U.S. Peace Council and others support the people of Okinawa in keeping the military base out. Right. Yeah. The people of Okinawa just voted overwhelmingly to keep it out. Did the United States pay any attention to it? No. So where is this democracy that we claim to be exporting around the world? It, do it doesn't exist, and it doesn't really exist here at home either. So I do also want to just, um, can't ask people to speak, but I wanted to acknowledge, let's see if I get this right, the new African Black Panther Party. Is, is in the room. And also some from Newark, Tyrone Gadsden, who was involved in getting our state legislature to pass a law that allowed all prisoners to vote. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah. Bipartisan support, you don't get that very much anywhere. Um, and then, of course, there are Greens and other people here. Communist, communist Party, okay. 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 And, uh, you know, Communist and Greens, and I don't know who yeah. all else is yeah. here. But we, hmm? Listen, we, but we thank everybody for coming okay. out. Okay. And I'm uh, turning to Matthew, all right? Sorry. Yes. To ask another question. And we have this room till 9, right? Not yeah, 9. Yeah. Until the sun comes. <laughs> oh, and also I need to put in a plug for New Jersey Revolution Radio. Yeah. Uh, who's live streaming this and who's live streamed so many events that mainstream media will not cover at all. And they're hurting for money too, just like all of us are hurting for money. So if you have any extra you can spare, I know they'll appreciate New Jersey Revolution Radio. Uh, where would they find that on? 
www.njrevolutionradio.com, right on the banner over there. Right on the banner. So those of you watching the live stream can also contribute. Those of you here can contribute. Um, a lot of worthy causes here tonight. All right, now, Matthew, sorry. I could speak? Yes. You can hear? Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So, of course, the United States, for many years, has been starting its own fires around the world, um, especially in the Middle East. Um, I, had a, I had a question. How do we, so once these fires are started, now how do we put them out? That's a <laughs> Especially in something like Syria. Wow. So somewhere like that. And that's for either, whoever wants to take that question. Right. Because ob obviously we want to prevent these fires from being uh, started in the first place. But sometimes that's out of our power because, you know, we're only so many of us in this room. Um, so how, how do they get put out? That's a very important question, and it really reflects the kind of uh, uh, challenge that we have. We have to build um, movement. Uh, we have to be able to make sure that uh, these wars that the U.S. is involved in, that seem so far away, so disconnected to everyday life here in this country, we've got to make those realities there reality here. Yeah. In other words, yeah. mm -hmm. we can't allow for things to just go along in this normal course of events. That if you have an effective uh, anti-war movement, yeah. then we go to the streets when we have these kinds of acts of aggression. Yeah. Yeah, Part of the issue we have in this country is that because uh, these wars are being, uh, they, they usually are, are air wars, hmm. Uh, or if they are, if there is the introduction of, of troops, uh, the people who are fighting these wars are from the working class, yeah. uh, black and brown uh, yeah. uh, working class people, poor people. Yeah, sure. uh, so the vast majority of the people in this country aren't touched by this. Okay, So uh, we say our responsibility, being in the belly of the beast, is to make uh, the rulers uncomfortable with these kinds of, of decisions. Uh, we want to prevent these wars, but when they start, we can't just say, well, it started, so, you know, yeah. we can't do anything about it, you know, and, and, and that's it. No, we've got to uh, struggle, we've got to intensify the resistance, we've got to uh, remind people of their moral responsibility to oppose uh, criminality that's being done in their name. So, again, it all goes back yeah. to the absolute necessity for building powerful, progressive, radical structures here yeah. in this country. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. It's funny, Matthew, that you should use the word fire, and you should also say fire in Syria, and then should also t talk about stopping it from spreading, because one of the people we met with on our delegation was the Grand Mufti, the Grand Mufti of Islam in Syria. And he said to us, he said, a fire was started here in Syria, and if it's not put out in Syria, it can spread throughout the world. Now, he didn't mean by the fire, he's talking about outside terror organizations, mercenary groups that came into Syria and started to take advantage of the Arab Spring or whatever you want to call it. And so that was yeah. fueling, not... I mean, I got into a lot of trouble for this, as Bauman said earlier. Not a civil war, but a war between outside forces and the people of Syria trying to defend their own sovereignty. And so after that visit, when it wasn't very long after that, there were attacks in France and England, people who were pushing the outside mercenaries or supporting the agenda of the U.S. and the outside mercenaries in Syria. So... In order to combat it, we have to recognize it. We have to recognize where it's coming from and what it is, and make connections. So it's not just Syria, but it's you know the, the same language used to demonize its leader, Assad. It's the same language that's been used to demonize Maduro. 
I'm not saying that, there are, that these are not, I'm not putting any judgment on who they are and what they are. All I'm saying is the United States has no business in either place intervening to change the regime. And that's what we have to know. We have to put, and Bauman has said this to me many times, we put one and one and one and one and one together and make five. Not one over here, one over there, and one over there. It's all connected, and the more we see the connections, the better equipped we are to fight back together because we understand what it is. Yeah. It's not one over, one place right, right. separated from another. So, um, also I want to say, did Bauman, did you want to answer the question too? Uh, we also need to, we also would like to raise some money for the facility here. Okay. We all, we didn't charge any admission um, because the Emanuel Lutheran Church was very nice, always is in donating the space. Diane's got a basket there. If you want to throw something into the basket so we can give the church something, that would be great. Um, are there another question? Please. Putting it all, putting it all together, uh, please address the idea of an electoral component to, to that work. Okay. In the United States. I shared uh, some components that I thought uh, could be important in um, bringing attention to the issues of militarism and war for the 2020 election. Now, that uh, those efforts are mainly in the in the in the field of of a very important part of our struggle, which is the ideological struggle. But, um, you know, this engagement with the public on this issue is has to take place now. Uh, we have to try to make it a uh, issue in 2020, and we have to continue to make it an issue. Now, if we, uh, if we see that the best route to do that is to um, engage the electoral process, then that's something we would need to, to, to consider and develop the kind of strategies we need to develop in order to do that. Um, I believe, as an individual, that that is absolutely necessary. That we cannot allow, we can't allow these um, uh, representatives, especially the ones who define themselves as progressive, uh, to be able to uh, not take definitive stance on where they are with the issue of yeah. war and militarism. Yeah. 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 Right now, you could be a, 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 a progressive, uh, uh, even a radical, and can be silent on the issue of Venezuela. That's, yeah. that's, yeah. that's absurd. Yeah. Incredible. So we have a responsibility to make this an issue uh, in the electoral yeah. process uh, as we build our uh, dual and contending power, uh, you know, we have to enter into the electoral process um, and force these politicians to take stances on these, pos on these positions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've got to use the electoral process as an educational tool uh, to educate the people on these issues and to uh, uh, persuade them that it's in their interest to be opposed to these uh, military uh, imperialist adventures. Right. So this issue of, of war and militarism strategically has to be looked at in terms of the electoral uh, arena, but the bottom line message has to be to the American people is that war uh, and militarism is a class <coughs> component, that it is a class issue, and that the people who are fighting and the people who we end up fighting against are normally, are usually working class and poor people right. in other countries. So we've got to, to, to raise these kind of issues in that way in every arena uh, possible, in the churches, in the electoral arena, in the schools. Uh, that's the only way that we can engage in effective education uh, and resulting in building more powerful organizations. I keep on going back to that 
thing, my friends, because that's what we have to do. If we don't have uh, uh, effective organizations, we can't do anything. Right, right, right. right, right. I'm going to speak from my ex recent experience for just a little bit because I was, I was demonized for running as a Green Party in this last U.S. Senate race because I had the gall to bring up the issues of war and peace. And people would tell me, oh, I don't want to talk about war and peace. That's a distraction. I said, a distraction? Um, no, it's the key. It's the central issue because... As we've heard tonight, and as you already know, war costs money. More than 50% of the taxes we pay, the, the, the discretionary, the decisions made by U.S. Congress about how to spend it, goes to war and peace. So if you're not fighting against war or opposing war, then you're basically saying, as so many have said more eloquently than I, you're robbing communities of the money they need for the for yeah. infrastructure for schools for health care sure. and all of the rest not only did people say that war and peace was a distraction colleagues of mine said the only ethical choice to make in this election is to vote for senator menendez the only, or the most ethical choice. I don't remember. The only, the only ethical choice. Because if we didn't, if a person didn't vote for Senator Menendez, then the possibility would be to have Bob Hugan as, as our senator. Now, immediately after the elections, if you've been following Senator Menendez, you see he's adamant in fa adamantly in favor of the coup and the regime change in Venezuela. He's still uh, in favor of, he backs Israel 3,000% and has no words of support for Palestinians. He's, and somebody told, said this uh, over dinner, it's true. He's been emboldened to do these things because six years from now, he knows no matter how warlike and warmongering he is, if he wants to run again, he, the Democrats will back him. So, I mean, this is from my own personal experience. I'm not saying all Democrats, but I'm saying, and this, this is how I view it, because the majority of Democrats and Republicans all support war, the issue of war is not supposed to be an electoral issue because it's not one that divides them, it's one that unites them. There are other issues that clearly divide Democrats and Republicans, but war does not. And so I underline what Ajamu said over and over and over again. We have to make it the issue. We connect it to all the issues in our communities. It's not just, I mean just about war. It's big time about war and destruction and death of people all over the world. But it's also about our own communities, our own health as a nation, and what we need to do here at home. And if we don't talk about it, then we have a lot to answer for. Thank you. Chris, question. Sure, I was hoping Ajama can share to the audience a little bit of the shift in the agenda in South America with the Lima Group in Brazil recently for people that might not yeah. be totally aware, because yeah. it's tough for us to get good information about this um, yeah. up here. The, um, the rulers in the U.S. have been quite active recently in um, organizing uh, effective opposition to Venezuela and the progressive, or what we might may call uh, revolutionary process in Latin America. They went back to the playbook that they developed in Africa when they split uh, forces on the African continent uh, back in the 1960s when they created the Morovian group to oppose the uh, uh, Casablanca group that was the progressives. Uh, and so they dusted off that playbook and what they have done is to organize this so-called Lima group of reactionary states yeah. Uh, to oppose Venezuela 
and the progressive motion in Latin America. Uh, using the um, Lima grouping, they have, uh, they're the ones that try to uh, suggest that uh, the elections uh, in Venezuela were illegitimate. Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, recognize Juan uh, Guaido as mm -hmm. the so-called yeah. president. Um, they are the ones that seem to be in support of, of military intervention into um, uh, Venezuela. Now, the reason that the U.S. Uh, and these reactionary states are so focused on Venezuela is because of the fact that there was this tremendous uh, motion toward radical transformation in Latin America, spearheaded by the Bolivarian process. The enemy understood that if you undermine Venezuela, then you can reverse that process completely. And we were desperately trying to get people to understand why the U.S. was preoccupied in, in the Middle East, that they were going to pivot back toward Latin America. And we saw that happen beginning around 2013. By 2015, the Obama administration declared that uh, Venezuela was a, a, a threat to national security. Why? No one can really explain why. Uh, in rational terms, we knew that politically what that meant was that they wanted to undermine the process in Latin America. So they have been quite uh, effective uh, once they began to refocus on Latin America and uh, putting a real break on the progressive motion uh, in the region. Um, Ecuador is now moving to, uh, to the right. Uh, Bolivia is more and more isolated because of what's happening with uh, uh, Venezuela. Um, uh, Haiti is in, in, in uprising, but they are almost by themselves, and they are focusing uh, and get ready to, 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 to increase the in, in, uh, focus on Cuba and Nicaragua. So this is part of a, of a broad reactionary program uh, in Latin America. And that's why, again, we're going back to what we have to do. We've got to remind people in North America that they are part of the Americas. Which means we have to build an American-wide consciousness that our movements here, our progressive movements, need to be linked in with the progressive movements throughout the entire hemisphere. Okay? That's the direction that we have to go. We've got to identify with the struggling people of the Americas who are in revolt and resistance to their local oligarchies. We here in North America are, are in the belly of the beast of the greatest oligarchy on the planet. So our interests, our common interests, we have to surface those, those common interests Build, build more effective structures with the people of Latin America and live up to our responsibility to put it all on the line when this uh, criminal state engages in the kinds of, of, of actions against humanity that we see has been involved in for the last, well, we say last few decades because it's become it is more egregious, um, but really from the very inception of this nation. also wanted to mention that I know I, I talked about Senator Menendez, but we shouldn't let Senator Booker off the hook. <laughs> it's it's what? We kicked this button. You. Right. We, we, people are also trying to get Senator Booker to make a statement on Venezuela, and he has not done so, which means he's complicit. To this point, if you don't say anything, you're complicit. Exactly. Uh, and so we do have an online petition. NewJerseyPeaceCouncil.org. If you go to to that NJ. website, so I said. Oh no, I said New Jersey. NJPeaceCouncil.org. There's an online petition that is against uh, the U.S. intervention in Venezuela, uh, and if you sign it, a copy. Uh, each one of the New Jersey delegation receives notification that you signed it. So you sign it, everybody gets one. 
all, you know, what both of our senators and all of our congressional delegations. So if you haven't signed it yet, go online now or tomorrow or later when you get home and sign it. We got to flood these people, these elected officials, excuse me, um, <laughs> with, our, with our points of view. Um, so that's, that's one thing I, I failed to mention. And we, we'll see. We'll see where Senator Booker comes down on this, but it doesn't look good. <laughs> and even the ones, even the, the people in Congress who've said something about Venezuela, pretty milk toast. They're not going into whether or not uh, Gua, Guaido, Guaido, is that Guaido? Guaido, Guaido. Gua, well, somebody said Gua, Guaido. Uh, it doesn't, you know what, you know who I mean, and I'm following what somebody told me. Anyway, um, they're not looking at that essential fact, which the United States had no right to recognize him in the first place. You know, so, so it's illegal, it has to be undone, and nobody's addressing, nobody in the Congress is addressing that. Um, we are, and we must continue to do so. All right, is there any, are there any other questions? Questions? So, a lot, and one more round of applause for Ramon, Jamu, and all of us who are here. And let's go and carry the words forward. I'd like to invite if folks want to take a picture with the banner before they go. Yeah. Put it on social media everywhere. Oh no. We understand the <laughs> <laughs> <All right, good. laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you.